Good evening. I'm Mark Kligman, director of the Low Milken Center for Music, American Jewish Experience at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. We welcome you to our third part in our four part series, Jewish Prayer in Many Languages. This is the portion of Shabbat part two with Asher Shasha Levy. Before I introduce Asher, I want to give a thanks to our partners in this project, to Professor Sarah Bunin Benor from Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, as well as to Dr. Lori Black, Associate Director of our center at UCLA, and to Beth Kramer for all, all their help in making things uh, work together. So this event is presented by us at the Lowell Milken Center for Music and American Jewish Experience, the Hebrew Union College Jewish Language Project, as well as the Cantor's Assembly, the Sephardic Education Center, Sephardic Studies at the University of Washington Strom Center for Jewish Studies in Los Angeles, Hebrew High. We're glad that we have all these partners. So it gives me great pleasure to reintroduce Asher Shasha Levy, who is a performer, a teacher, a writer, a recording artist, and a wonderful musician who really strings together many different aspects of history of the Syrian community and many other Sephardi Mizrahi communities, looking at Piotim and Pismonim. It's such a pleasure to uh, welcome and please uh, let us all greet Asher Shasha Levi. Thank you so much, Dr. Kligman. Thank you to all of our sponsors and to everyone who has returned for yet another concert lecture on this very interesting topic of vernacular Jewish liturgy or Jewish liturgy 
in many languages. So if you're if this is the first of the series that you're joining, what we've been doing is we've been taking a look at different aspects of Sephardic liturgy, primarily in Ottoman, Sephardic, and Syrian communities in the Americas, and how these liturgies in languages that are no longer really spoken, and so they've the purpose of using these languages has changed over the over the course of the tremendous disruptions in Sephardic life that occurred starting with the beginning, uh, really with the Balkan Wars and then the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the diaspora of these communities to many places, including the Americas. These languages initially, Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Spanish, would have been the lingua franca of the community that everyone spoke, uh, men and women, and it would have been something that would have made these prayers very much understood. Whereas now, these, these prayers, these liturgies in these ancestral languages become something that it's clung to from another position in history. So this is something of the past that then becomes a, a reminder of what was, of, of the, uh, uh, the depth of life that existed in these communities. So the Syrian community in Brooklyn, which is the community that my family um, came to, from, from Syria and border towns of Turkey, uh, Kilis, Gazi, and Tab, towns that today are part of Turkey, but were very much part of the uh, Syrian Jewish milieu. And at the time under Ottoman rule, they were part of the Aleppo province. So there's certainly a connection between all of these communities. And so when we speak of the Syrian community in America, I think it's important to note that the identity is Syrian, the Judeo-Arabic language that's spoken is colloquially, colloquially called Syrian, but many of the people in the community were either Syrian in a few generations back and then their families went to Egypt or to Lebanon, or were not Syrian at all. In fact, you have uh, members of the general Syrian community who are uh, Yerushalmi from old Jerusalem Sephardic families, or Egyptian or these various Levantine communities that coalesced in, the, in primarily in New York as the Syrian identity. So we're going to be looking at a few very interesting liturgies because in past weeks, we've seen that there's such a richness among the Judeo-Spanish vernacular liturgies. We have every Shabbat in the synagogue in communities in LA and in Seattle and in Florida and in New York among uh, congregations that trace their lineage back to Turkey or Rhodes. You have the Berik Sheme, you have the Enkelohenu that are sung in Ladino as part of the actual liturgy in the synagogue. And that's something that is very different from the Syrian community uh, with their Judeo-Arabic. From what I understand, there is no use of Judeo-Arabic as the community, by the way, I, I should explain. So I, I'm going to be speaking about Judeo-Arabic, but there are really two different, two different strands of the language that are at play here. There's what's called Syrian, colloquially, which is the spoken Judeo-Arabic that people understood. It had a, uh, it has elements of Ladino in it, actually, of Spanish in it, of some Italian words, uh, substrate of Aramaic, all of these different things. Then there's the Sharah, which is sort of like Ladino is the Calc version of Judeo-Spanish, and Judezbo or Judeo-Espanol is what people spoke. The Sharah was sort of an official version of the language that was, that was popularized through translated holy texts. Uh, and this goes back very, very ancient. You have the translation, the tafsir, the translation of the Torah from Sa'adia Gaon, um, already in the early medieval period. And in fact, that tafsir, that translation, is one of the elements of Judeo-Arabic that is used in a, I would say, a quasi-liturgical way among the Syrian Jews of Brooklyn. So the Ten Commandments, the, the Ashur Kalimat, is done not publicly in the synagogue, but it is done in at the home. So this is something that people would recite at home. And in fact, it's done in sort of a public way around Tubishvat. So there's an association with this chanting for Tubishvat, um, which is interesting because Tubishvat does not have a lot of strict liturgy. There's not like Hallel that you say on Tubishvat or all of these things. So that 
that translation, that that sharach, that that tafsir, is something that was translated. But what we're looking at today are things that would be in more common use. Are there pieces in Judeo-Arabic that would be used, for instance, every Shabbat? And I haven't really found any, is a very interesting thing. I didn't grow up with any. Um, and in asking different Hazanim, basically, I understand that it doesn't really exist on a week-to-week -week basis. So it's not like there's going to be a pismon in Judeo-Arabic along with all of the Hebrew pismonim. It's not like there's going to be a section of the tefillah that's going to be done in Judeo-Arabic instead of or in addition to Hebrew, like in the Judeo-Spanish communities. But as mentioned with the Ten Commandments chanting at, at Tu Bishvat, this is something that does exist in the home. Another example of that, probably the most notable example and the one that is perpetuated in the most households, including in our household, is the chanting of the, of the Seder, of the Agadah of Pesach, in the Sharach, at least parts of it. So there is the the Judeo-Arabic Sharach, which is a little different depending on where you go. The Baghdadi publications, which are, which are quite numerous, are a bit different from what you find in the Syrian community in New York, but not, say, as different as the spoken varieties. It's still, it's still quite similar. You'll have a word here or there that changes. But this is something that's done in many, many Syrian households. The other piece, which is what we're going to focus on, which is situated, I would say, between a private ritual of the household and the public rituals of the synagogue is that of habdalah, the separation between Shabbat and the weekdays. I see have a I see we have a question. Um, the sharah, yeah, the sharah is a uh, a type of I would say it's the calc version of Judeo Arabic. So it's the version of Judeo Arabic that is um, translations more or less literally from holy Hebrew texts. In fact, I would say that a sharah is exactly the same as a targum. If you're familiar with um, the targum, any of the Aramaic tar targumim, like unkulus, it's a translation into that language in a, a sort of literal idiom. So that's, that's what the sharah is. So we have that for um, the Haggadah, and we have that for uh, actually the whole Torah, but it, it's used sparingly in public recitations in the Syrian community. And again, I'm speaking here about the Syrian community in the United States primarily. When I speak about other communities, I'll, I'll, make, it, I'll make it clear. So the Habdalah is something that happens. It's, it's something that, that's not a home ritual necessarily, and that it can happen either, either or. So it's, it's sort of on this liminal space. It's not the same as the Berik Shemei, in, in the Ladino tradition, that when every time the Torah is taken out, it's done in, with this whole pomp and circumstance. The things of Arabic that we find in the Habdalah are things that are, in some ways, you could say optional. They're among a list of pismonim, and they will be done in the Kinesis, they'll be done at home, but they're not part of the, the mandated ritual, so to speak. And in fact, there are many pismonim that have the same tunes for this time. So oftentimes a Hebrew pismon or two will be done to the tune and not the Arabic. So um, the thing about Syrian, there's a, I think there's a lot of sort of background knowledge that, that should be explained about Syrian practice in particular. So among the Syrian Jews, there is this practice of the pismonim. And pismonim is, um, they're, they're songs of praise, basically. And they were first applied to the refrains of piyutim. So either the last line of the first stanza or the first line of each stanza, and this was repeated, and this is called the pismon. In modern Hebrew, a pismon is a chorus of a song. So that earlier definition lives on in, in modern Israeli Hebrew. Um, but subsequently, the type of piyutim that had these sort of refrains would be called pismonim. And then in later times, all of this basically devolved, and pismonim just basically means religious songs in the Syrian setting, most of which are, um, most of which I would say are, are contrafacta. 
draw from Arabic and Turkish musical styles and most often take melodies directly from popular tunes of the day. And so you can sort of identify these, these pismonim in their historical setting based on oftentimes on what, what the tune would be. Uh, and then you have the, the difference really in the Syrian tradition between piyutim and pismonim is that the piyutim are printed in the sidur and are part of the mandatory or traditional, so to speak, liturgy. So you'll have the piyutim on, you know, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you have all of these piyutim that are part of the tefillah, whereas pismonim are things that are done in an extra liturgical context, you could say. So that's what the, that's what the pismonim are. And, and these pieces that we're looking at today in Judeo-Arabic would be classified as pismonim, though I guess it gets a little bit complicated because the pieces we're looking at today are either not or not necessarily contrafacta. So we don't know what the origins of the melodies of the pieces that we're looking at today are. They may be original. They may be tunes that the origin has been lost to us, but we will, we will, we will see that in time. So in order to give a sense of the feeling of what is setting up the environment for these pismonim, I'd like to listen to um, the beginning of a couple different habdalot from Hazan Yehiel Nahari, who is a Syrian Hazan, very famous and very elaborate singer. So many people would say that his style is not old school Aleppo style. It's more influenced by the Jerusalem Sephardic traditions, which is more elaborate and ornate. But the reason that I'd like to play this is because it really gives you a good feeling for how the habdalah, like all of the prayers in the Syrian tradition, are done in a different maqam every single week. So what's a maqam? A maqam um, related to the word maqam in Hebrew or for place. Um, the maqam is the scale or the musical mode that is used in all of the pismonim. All the pismonim have a, have a maqam and is also the starting point for a Syrian tefillah, for a Syrian prayer. So the hazan has some leeway, has some improvisational leeway within the maqam and the hazan also can choose melodies within the maqam. So you'll see there are different lists that show what this, what, um, you know, what Kabi did and what Tawil did and what, you know, Shrem did and all these different hazanim, they'll have the different lists and you'll be able to understand kind of how to improvise within that. So I think the first one that we are going to hear from Nahari is a uh, Habdallah in Bayat, which is the maqam that I actually improvised on at the beginning of today. And the subsequent one we're going to hear is in Saba. So you can really get a sense for the improvisatory element of this tradition. <laughs> You're muted, Asher. Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. So what the Hazan does is he sets up the mood of the maqam through quite elaborate improvisation. The Habdallah in the Syrian tradition allows for quite elaborate improvisation with, within the maqam. I would say that Nahari goes further than most of the Hazanim in terms of really exploring what you would call the sire of the maqam, the sort of ladder and structure of it. But he really gives you a good grounding with that. So to hear the difference of how we would approach in a different maqam, we're gonna to listen to the, the same phrase, 
but in Maqam Saba. Azure, it looks like that's the same link. Okay, let's uh, let's not listen to the one of Saba then. We'll we'll skip that. You get you get a good enough sense, I think, of of the ability to improvise. In fact, what I'll do is I'll show you a little bit of how Saba would differ. So Bayat, you have. That's Bayat, and then the Saba would be. So you can really improvise and you can really set up the phrase uh, in, a, in a certain way with the Abdallah. So we're not focusing on the Abdallah today because the Abdallah is done in Hebrew. It's, it's a more or less standard text that you would find in Sephardic communities, though something that I do notice is that almost every Syrian community has slight variations on what they do at the very beginning of the Abdallah with the uh, Eliyahu pa uh, passage before you get into the Kos Yeshuot Esa, there's a lot of, lot of differences. But the thing that, that is common is lots and lots of pismonim about Eliyahu. So you have this tradition of all of these different pismonim about Eliyahu. So, so why, why is that? I, I think it's because of a historical association of the prophet Elijah with these particular communities. So the Damascus Syrian Jews and the Aleppo Syrian Jews, Jews from Beirut, Jews from Istanbul, these places are all associated in the tradition with the travels of Eliyahu Anabi. So for instance, in Jobar in Syria, near Damascus, there was a place that was for, un until really the, the 1990s, I believe, it was a synagogue, an active synagogue and pilgrimage site that commemorated a place, I believe, where Eliyahu Anabi um, anointed Elisha, the prophet. Um, and so you have this connection of Eliyahu with, with the Syrian Jewish communities. So we're looking at some different pismonim today in Judeo-Arabic, and they, um, they, they all have the same melody. So this melody is a melody that it has a lot of depth of meaning just on the basis of the melody itself. So the melody itself is associated with Eliyahu. So you have all of these songs in Hebrew and in Judeo-Arabic that use this melody that are all about Eliyahu. And in addition, you have a usage for this melody on the Shabbat of Pinehas, of Parashat Pinehas. It's used for the Semehim Besetam. Why Parashat Pinehas? This is actually important for these Pismonim that we're going to look at. There's an association in many communities, but in particular, it seems the Syrian community of Pinehas in the Torah with Eliyahu Hanabi. So I believe that starting sometime in around the first century, there is this tradition that goes back to um, where, what is, what is the source from, from pseudo Philo that retells the story of Pinhas in a manner that doesn't actually say outright that Pinhas is the same as Eliyahu, but it infers it in such a way. So it, it, without saying Eliyahu's name explicitly, basically it says Pinhas was nourished by an eagle in the desert. Like Eliyahu was nourished by ravens. He will shut the heavens to open them. Um, so various parallels between the stories of Pinhas and Eliyahu, as well as the um, quality of kina or zealotry. Both of them were, were zealous for, for God in, in ways that, that could even be violent. So you have these characters that are connected and they're connected in the pismonim that we're gonna look at. So 
the melody is is um is as follows <laughs> That's the melody, and we're going to hear it in many, many different contexts. So the first one we're going to hear is in Hebrew. It's Amar Adonai Le Yaakov, and it's a group of Syrian community Hazanim. So you're going to hear the sort of antiphonal call and response quality that is typical in Syrian music and Syrian Jewish music. And this melody is done in many different ways, so we'll hear some different variations. So this is the um, Syrian community version. Amar Adonai le Yaakov, el Sira ki Yaakov. Bahar Adonai le Yaakov, el Sira ki Yaakov. Ya el Adonai ya Yaakov, el Sira ki Yaakov. Ya Rasof ki Yaakov. Beautiful. So we get a real sense for that, that melody that we just sort of cycle through. Um, the Hazan who's singing in that recording is uh, Gabriel Shrem, Allah HaShalom, who's one of the great, the great teachers and the great links between the old country heritage of Syria, in his case, Syria and Egypt, with the sustaining of these traditions in the new world, basically. Uh, because Gabriel Schrem immigrated to the United States in, in 1930 from Egypt. And while he was in Egypt as a young man, he was able to learn many, many different pismoni, many different methods of tefillah from Hazanim from Aleppo, as well as from Egyptian Hazanim who were beginning to create what would become the Jerusalem Sephardic style. And so the importance of Gabriel Schrem for everything that we're, we're dealing with today is primarily in the publication of this book. This book is called The Red Book, colloquially, and it's called Shir Ushpaha Halel Bezimra, and it's the first Syrian Jewish community pismonim book in America, published in the 1950s, and subsequently addended and addended and, and, and added to and, and, and so that you have this edition that I'm holding now from the 80s that sometimes will have like a page 156 A, B, C, D, E, F, like all of these different pages addended to each page. So you have a lot of a lot of depth in here and a lot of interesting interesting stuff. So the pismon, the primary pismon that we're going to look at is Habib Allah Eliyahu. And it's done to that same melody of uh, Amar Adonai Le Yaakob. And that melody is also used for many different pismonim, basically in a row, you could say. So you have Amar Adonai Le Yaakob, you have Habib La Eliyahu in Judeo-Arabic, you have Eliyahu bin Carmel in Judeo-Arabic. In some communities, Hamabdil ben Kodesh Lechol is done to this, uh, to this same melody. And there are more that escape me. That's more than enough that, that we're going to be able to go through today. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit of Habib Allah Eliyahu. And this is a, a very, very interesting pismon because, as I mentioned, there are very few pismonim in the Aleppo Syrian tradition as maintained in the United States that are in, that are in Judeo-Arabic, in, in what we call Syrian. And this is really, if I think about it, yeah, it's really one of the only Pismonim, other than, well, those are translated. This is really one of the, these Pismonim are some of the only Pismonim I know of in Syrian Judeo Arabic that are original works. They're not tran they're not that sharach. They're not a translation. So even the Pismonim that we sing at Pesach, um, like Min Yalamu Min Yadri, Wahajidi, these are just translations of Chagad Ya and Echad Miyudeya. They're not original Pismonim. So in the cycle of the year, this is this is unique, um, and. As I mentioned, the text of the Pismon ties Eliyahu Hanabi to Pinahas, as well as going through different travels of Eliyahu Hanabi in the area of Syria that tie into the community. Before I sing this, a word on Judeo-Arabic pronunciation and spelling. So I'm reading this from the text that's printed in the Red Book, 
which uses uh, an interesting orthography where you have um, basically all of the all of the sounds in Arabic represented with Hebrew letters. Most of them would be what you would expect. You have Aleph, like Hebrew, Bet. There's no Vet. It's just Bet. Anytime you see the letter is Bet, which is consistent with Hebrew pronunciation in Syrian. Um, you have um, the J sound. So you have a Gimel with a dash for J. And then a Gimel on its own would be pronounced Ra as, as a Rimel. You have Dalid. You have Val. You, which is a dalid with a with a dash or with a dot above it. Hey, wow, vav is pronounced as wow. Zayin het tet in the front tet, um, and then you also have la. So it's like a retracted z in a way. Yod kaf chaf lamed mem nun samech ein pe sadi, and then vag of, but in in the Syrian dialect, most often, qof is not pronounced at all. It's treated like an alif. Um, so you get words like ma'am instead of makam. Uh, resh, shin, taf, faf. So in this, the, this is the sort of orthography that you're dealing with here. So um, I'll just sing it. Habib ala Eliyahu, Aziz ala Eliyahu, Bin Hasbin el Azar yitsamma, Yirad el Ghathab min al Uma, Atal Kizbi u Zamri Rama, Ugar ala Zamraba u Habib ala Azar Hafid El Uma Eliyahu Alay El Salam Talmid Musa Bin Amiram Bidark El Rab Sierehu Habib Allah Eliyahu Aziz Allah Eliyahu Yidwi together and then the, the verses would be done by whoever is leading it. This idea of Habib Allah Eliyahu is uh, a common one that you'll see in different related 
pismonim that may or may not be the same. What do I mean by that? Well, you have different pismonim that have that that refrain of Habib Allah Eliyahu, that, that Eliyahu is the beloved of God, that come from different traditions and have different origin stories, so to speak, but I think that ultimately they are the same. So in the Iraqi tradition, you have this Habib Allah Eliyahu. Sometimes you'll see it as Habib El Rab Eliyahu. Why? In Arabic speaking Jewish traditions, Allah has a quality to it that is like saying Elohim, like saying an actual name of God. So in the same way that Hazanim, when they are not actually saying a Beracha, they will say Amonai instead of Adonai. They will say Amma instead of Allah when they are singing these songs for recordings or in a um, casual non-liturgical context, which I think is, is interesting to show the status of that. So the next pismon, I'm not going to sing it. We're going to listen to Gabriel Shrem singing it. Um, Lori, this is that we're going to skip the the first of the Shrem ones, the Habib Allah, and we're going to go straight to the second one, Eliyahu Bel Karmel. So this is the pismon that I was mentioning that is specific to the Syrian Jewish community, so Damascus and Aleppo. I'm not certain who composed this or, or the origin. It's, it's somewhat mysterious, but this pismon in a way shows, it, it's, a, it's a pismon that, that aims to connect the biblical narrative of Eliyahu, which in and of itself is connected to the biblical narrative of Pinhas, and to situate these narratives in the space that the community physically occupied in places like um, Halab, in Damascus, in, in, in Damascus, in uh, Beirut, in Istanbul, um, all of these towns, we're going to see them mentioned in this pismon. So we're going to now hear uh, Gabriel Shrem's rendition of Eliyahu Bil Karmel. Again, the same melody. <laughs> سبحانه إليه في المعرة يشعل له البنورة فيما أمو يقرأ الدورة نحن وجميع أمه إليه في الجوبة وجه يدوي كما الجوهة فيما أمو يقرأ الدورة So in the course of that, we heard about Eliyahu's travels. If, if one was to understand the Judeo-Arabic narrative, it's basically talking about Eliyahu's travels through, through, through Carmel um, and Halab, Jobar, which is right outside of Damascus, Beirut, Istanbul. And so what this song does is it, it serves to locate those stories in something that is the home of the Syrian Jewish community. So the Syrian Jewish community has this, this connection to the land, the Bil Adal Sham, this Levantine area that is very ancient. And in many ways, the Syrian community considered themselves, even though they were associated with Syria for at least 2,000 years. They considered their, at least parts of Syria, they considered to be part of the land of Israel and subject to 
certain biblical laws agriculturally and, and whatnot. So in that sense, Syria becomes an extension of, of the land of Israel, and, and there's a sort of dual sacred quality to, to the place, both as the place that they inhabited for thousands of years and contributed to the culture and, and created this incredible repertoire of pismonim and all these things, but also insofar as they really did feel, and, and many still do feel, that these historically, these areas would have been areas that were traversed by many characters from the Tanakh. So there's not a lot of light that I can really shed on the origins of this pismon. The Iraqi community says that this pismon, the, the Habib Allah Eliyahu, and the assorted versions were composed by um, Ribi Yosef Hayim, better known as the Benish Hai. While I don't have much to go on to say that that's not true, I don't think it's necessarily true because the Syrian community seems to have an older link to this. And, and, and it is possible that the Ben Ishchai wrote this and that the melody existed as something else previously, but there seems to be a connection of this piece to the Syrian community. So I'm, I'm sorry that I can't really shed more light on the origins. And certainly if there is more information that I do dig up in the course of my research, you will be able to find it on the Jewish Language Project website, where all of these liturgies that we've been looking at over the past few months, they're going to be up there for, for people to access. So I want to move now to the last thing that we're going to look at today, which is a very interesting confluence of Syrian and Judeo-Spanish musical culture through the Jerusalem Sephardic tradition, but also independently. So the piece is another Eliyahu song. It's another song that actually associates Eliyahu with Pinhas, but there are actually a few layers to this. So the first layer is the pismon Eroch Mahalel Nibi, which is a pismon in Hebrew that is sung on the Shabbat of Parashat Pinchas. And it has a very famous chorus that, that many people know, which is Lichvod Hemdat Levavi Eliyahu Hanavi. And the melody for that pismon is famous through Habdalah which is very interesting. And I think it's not a coincidence that you have this melody used in Syrian, in Turkish, and in Jerusalem contexts for the Hamabdil of Habdallah. Why? It's because one, the Eroch Mahalal Nibi is part of the liturgy for Parashat Pinhas. Not, not part of the liturgy, but it's the Pismon of the week for Parashat Pinhas. And Pinhas, as we mentioned, is associated with Eliyahu. So um, let's do something very interesting. Let's listen to a recording of Eroch Mahalal Nibi by a group of Syrian cantors in Jerusalem in 1913. So this is a very, very old recording. I've asked around and no one is really sure who is on the recording. We're not necessarily sure if these are professionals or if they're amateurs, if they are Jerusalem Syrians or if they are a Lepin born, we don't really know but it is a beautiful insight into another era of this tradition. Really the, the era right before most of uh, the Syrian Jews came to, to the United States. In fact, that's right when 1913 is right around when my family came here. that is probably at this point best known through the Hamabdil. And I understand that the former president of Israel, Yitzhak Navon, had a, 
it was some sort of production, a theatrical production. I believe it was called Bustan Sfaradi. And as part of that, many of the Jerusalem Sephardic melodies were, were popularized in a broader Israeli idiom. And one of those is the melody of Hamabdil, which is the same melody that we just heard for Eeroch Mahalani B. And Syrians also use this for Hamabdil. I wasn't really able to trace what the origin of this. Is it a Jerusalem melody? The oldest version I found was that 1913 recording uh, among Syrian cantors in Jerusalem. But how did it become part of the different Ottoman liturgies? And how did the Hamab deal with that melody, which is probably Syrian, but it might not be? How did it gain a Judeo-Spanish stanza? And what's the origin of this? I'm not sure, but I was able to sort of better understand the confluence of Judeo-Spanish Ottoman liturgy and Syrian Jewish liturgy and Jerusalem Sephardic liturgy. We often think of these things as being independent, but they're not. There's definitely a lot of overlap between these things. It's, it's well known that the Jerusalem Sephardic tradition is mostly based on a, a substrate of Syrian Hazanut with a lot of Egyptian influence and a lot of Turkish influence. And it seems that it's not only that standardization in the Jerusalem Sephardic tradition that binds these traditions. It seems that even in the era of the Ottoman Empire, because there was so much contact between all of the different Jewish communities, there would have been a common repertoire of melodies. So perhaps this is what that is. Perhaps not. I, I don't know definitively. But it's an, it's a, it's an interesting window to, to see and it breaks down these concepts that people have of, you know, the Syrian Jews being culturally somehow cut off from the Ladino speaking Jews in the other parts of the Ottoman Empire. And while there are certainly major differences culturally, religiously, and all of these things, there's definitely something, something in common there. So what I'd like to do is uh, before I play a bit of Hamabdil in the Hebrew and in the Judeo-Spanish, I think it would be nice to listen to um, something that really represents, I think, that fusion of cultures that is the Jerusalem Sephardic tradition. Yehoram Gaon, who is a very famous Israeli actor and singer who recorded albums of Judeo-Spanish music in the Jerusalem Sephardic tradition that really popularized many of these melodies throughout the Jewish world. It's a version of him doing Hamab deal with uh, the Hiba ensemble, which is a basically an ensemble that plays in, in a more Arabic style. So it has Arabic instrumentation and a strong influence from the classic Arabic music that like Farid al-Atrash and Um Kaltum and all of these sources that would also become the, the sources for many of the melodies of the Pismoni. So we're going to listen to Yoram sing the Judeo-Spanish verse with what is basically an Arabic musical backing. And it really shows beautifully the, the confluence of these traditions. <laughs> basically an Arabic musical backing, um, which shows, you know, this melody, you'll, there are many different versions you can hear. I recommend the, uh, the Janet and Jack Asim version if you want to hear something that is very, very Turkish and not, not just Turkish Jewish when I say that. I mean, it's very much instrumentally arranged like contemporary Turkish music with fretless guitar and all of these things. It gives you a sense that, that oftentimes what we think of as being very Arabic sounding or very Turkish sounding is all a matter of ornamentation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to play a little takasim in the maqam, yes, Yehoram Gaon. Uh, 
So I'm going to play a little taqsim in, in the maqam, which is Hosseini, which is a type of bayat that has a, uh, a changed degree in the upper string. So instead of... It's a little higher there. Uh, and then I'll sing a couple verses of E'eroch Mahalan Libi, that, that pizmon for Parashat Pinhas that ties in with Eliyahu, a little bit of Hamabdil, and then the Judeo-Spanish stanza. for joining today as we explore these pismonim, Judeo-Arabic, of Habdallah. Uh, and now I'd like to open it up for any questions that anyone might have. Great. Thank you, Asher. Wow. That was excellent. And once again, we've learned so much, uh, not just about liturgy, but about history and Jewish languages and even words for God in Judeo-Arabic. And we learned that it's all about the ornamentation, that that's what makes it part of one tradition or another. And we've learned about the connections among these various communities that have something to say about the migration patterns of Jews. So uh, let's open it up for questions. Well, maybe you can say a little more about where these, what contexts these pismonim would have been sung and, and who exactly would have sung them. Yeah, definitely. So it's, it's interesting to note that while there is, there's a real absence of anything in the Syrian tradition that I would say is women's music or a, a place for women to contribute, until the 20th century, most Syrian Jewish women did not know Hebrew in any context, other than things that they would pick up or berachot that they would need to say. Most Syrian Jewish women did not 
didn't didn't know Hebrew until, and that started to change in the 20th century. But it's possible that these pismonim were there, like we've seen with the texts in Judeo-Spanish, to present something that would have been easily understandable to everyone, to women, to children, to those who were not as educated in Hebrew. And again, these pismonim present a certain a certain narrative, a certain there's a certain connection of these pismonim to really the sort of origin story of the Syrian Jewish community, you could even say, that this was something very important for people to understand, is that the Jewish presence in Syria is, is one and the same as basically the Jewish biblical presence in the land of Israel, that there's something very rooted there. Um, so you, you would have these pismonim would be sung in, I would say, a a liminal context between public and private. So you have habdallah that would be done in the synagogue, but oftentimes the pismonim would be done as at home and not always in the synagogue. And in the synagogue, it might be a different selection at different times. So I would say that these Judeo-Arabic pieces in particular have this sort of, they're very much paraliturgy. They very much operate parallel to, but not as part of, the Syrian liturgy that would be done in the synagogue. Okay, well, so there's a question here about the Ladino verse, and you did mention that there was a Ladino verse in Hamabdil. Yes. Um, anything else you want to say about that? Yeah, so this Ladino verse of Hamabdil is, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery to me. I would say that I, I can't fully answer that question right now, because in doing research for today, I was trying to find an old version of it, something in an old Sidur or an old manuscript, and I couldn't find it. So I wonder if this, I, this is totally speculation, and I may be, I may well be completely wrong on this, but it is actually possible that this melody came from the Syrian Jewish community of Aleppo in the early 20th century was brought to Jerusalem, like we hear, and that the Jerusalem Sephardic Jews, who were actually, they were part of the Syrian community in Jerusalem in a way, you could say. So you have these figures like Asher Mizrahi, who's the composer of, of Nagila Hallelujah, and of Habibi Ya Habibi, all of these iconic songs that were created in a Syrian Jewish milieu in Jerusalem, but also in other contexts. So you can sort of see the trans- national quality of this community in that Asher Mizrahi was a Hazan in the burgeoning Jerusalem Sephardic style based on Syrian, but he himself was a Ladino speaker. He, was a, he came from a family, I believe from Salonika, and he, ha, he, would, he was a Judeo-Spanish speaker, but he was also a star in the Arab world. So he, he later left Israel when there wasn't enough work for him and became the Hazan in I believe it was in Tunisia, in a North African community, until things became a little rough there and he moved back to Israel at the end of his life. But you can see how these communities are very interconnected, especially at that time. Today, we're in a sort of, everything is frozen today because of the, the vast, it, it's, it's impossible for me to overstate how vast the disruption was of the 20th century in, ter in terms of all of these communities. So most of these communities in, in a sort of state of trauma basically take their culture frozen at a certain point. And what you miss there is the fluidity between many of these communities and how, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of this is just local style and ornamentations. You would not believe how many arguments I have gotten into with Turkish and Greek Ladino speaking Jews who don't believe that the Syrian ta'amim of the Torah are the same but just using the principles of Arabic harmony rather than the principles of Turkish harmony. So quarter tones as opposed to eighth tones. They say, no, it's completely different. They say, what you do is Arabic and what we do is Sephardic, but really it's all the same. It's just local, local color, I guess, I guess you could say. So with, the, with regard, that was a long tangent coming to this verse, but basically, I'm unsure how it came to be, but my, my guess is that it was probably a 20th century Jerusalem composition that then was spread to Sephardic communities around the world. And this actually has, the reason I'm saying that this could be very possible is that there's precedent for this. So many people think that the song Bendigamos is a, is a Judeo-Spanish song from the Ottoman Empire, because you'll hear it in LA, you'll hear it in Seattle, 
it's not. It's actually the origin of it is in French, I believe. And then it was translated from French in the, I believe it was the Bordeaux S&P community. Don't quote me on that. One of the French S&P communities, Spanish, Portuguese, translated it into modern Spanish. And so that's where you get Bendigamos that then comes through Curaçao in the Caribbean and various other places like Jamaica, where you have a meeting of Eastern Sephardic Jews and Western Sephardic Jews. The Eastern Sephardic Jews adopt the song, they bring it, and now everyone thinks it's Ladino. So with a crazy <laughs> historical situation like that, you can easily imagine how a Syrian melody gets to Jerusalem and the local Ladino speaking Sephardic Jews whose culture was pretty similar, especially in Jerusalem, how that could happen. So that, that's my guess. Okay, and that relates to the last two questions, which we have, which are, have these, have Pismonim and these modes been brought into non-Syrian Jewish context? And in which synagogues here in LA might we hear these melodies? That's a great question. So in terms of uh, have these, have, has this been done in non, non-Sephardic contexts? Yes, I would say that a lot of sort of liberal Jewish communities many associated with conservative and reform have been more open to incorporating Sephardic melodies. Uh, a very good example of that is in New York in B'nai Jeshurun that I know has Sephardic clergy. They've brought in a lot of Sephardic music, but so he, here's the thing, here's the thing. It's not necessarily the authentic music because it's stripped of the microtones. So in a way, in, in a strange way, some of these versions that you'll hear of Syrian pismonim that have no microtones remind me more of the way that the Iraqi tradition in Southeast Asia sort of lost its microtones in certain ways. And so it's not, it's not a, a necessarily a bad thing. It's just an interesting thing. And it's worth noting in most of these places where you have an importation, you also have no context. So it's a song rather than a part of a tefillah that's all about building on one particular music, scale, maqam, whatever you want to think of it as. Okay, wow, Asher, we've learned so oh, and much I should, today. I should oh, mention the yeah. second, the second, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, but the, the second part of the question was where you can hear this in LA. Um, you can go to Magen David of Beverly Hills as a Syrian synagogue that I know um, has the weekly, it's the only place in LA to my knowledge that goes by the weekly schedule of the Muhammad. But there are other synagogues, many other synagogues that are in the Jerusalem Sephardic style. So like Sha'ar Yerushalayim in uh, North Hollywood area and many others, which is a Syrian based style with Egyptian, Iraqi and uh, Turkish influence. Okay, and I'm glad you brought up the uh, South Asian connection with the Baghdadi Jewish community because that was actually the subject of the most recent Jewish language project event. It was uh, a talk by Sasha Goldstein Saba with a response by Benjamin Hari about that community, the diaspora, the, the Baghdadi Jewish diaspora. And you can see a recording of that on the Jewish language project website. Just click on events and uh, you can always check there for upcoming events from the Jewish language project. And thank you all for coming and thank you so much to uh, the all of our co-sponsors and to Asher. And please do join us for the next session in this series. And Asher, just give us a quick teaser for that. Yeah, so this one is for me, one of the most exciting and richest. We're gonna look at basically a, a large chunk of the Silichot that was translated into Judeo-Spanish and sung oftentimes antiphonally Hebrew and Judeo-Spanish using melodies that are common to many different Sephardic communities around the Middle East. So we'll discuss sort of the historical circumstances that led to the need for this and how controversial it was. And we'll have different historical recordings and it'll be a beautiful way to get a little bit of a taste of this unique Judeo-Spanish tradition, because I don't know of really any other tradition that does such a huge portion of the services on the high holidays in a local language. Okay, well, thank you. We'll see you all there.